Yeah, same as Sorry. Yes. Hi, everyone. I think we're about ready to get started. So I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and also thank um, the Napa County Library for once again letting us use their community room. My name is Kathleen. I'm with Napa Bookmine. And I just want to let you know that we will be having another event here next month um, with author and KQED host Olivia Allen Price for her book, Bay Curious, Exploring the Hidden True Stories of the San Francisco Bay Area. This event will take place Sunday, June 4th at three o'clock here in the community room. And we're also very excited to announce that we'll soon be hosting events in our Napa store again once we've moved to our new location on Second Street later in June. You can learn more about our events and book clubs at napabookmind.com. Now, please take a moment to turn off or silence your phones or anything else that might make noise during the event. Tonight, we welcome Mark Gudgel. Mark is a Nebraska native, the author of numerous books and articles, and a regular contributor to several periodicals. His book, Think, Think Higher, Feel Deeper, Holocaust Education in the Secondary Classroom, was released from Teachers College Press in the fall of 2021. His new book, The Rise of Napa Valley Wineries, How the Judgment of Paris Put California Wine on the Map, explores the trials and tribulations of Napa's meteoric rise to prominence. In 1976, the picturesque agrarian Napa Valley was all but unknown to those who didn't live there. That changed dramatically when Stephen Spurrier and Patricia Gallagher decided to host a wine tasting of American and French wines in Paris. When wines from California defeated those of France, the world was shocked an industry reawakened, and Napa Valley exploded in a frenzy of growth and development. Families who had farmed for generations battled to hang on to their land, and many paid a steep price as the area transformed into one of the world's premier wine-growing regions. Mark will first discuss his book, followed by a question and answer session to the audience. His book is also available for sale after the event, and Mark is happy to sign them. Thank you once again for joining us, and please welcome Mark Gudgel. Hey, good evening. Thanks for coming here. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. I'm really uh, grateful to the people who came this evening. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the bookmine in particular. My parents have a small bookstore, and um, I think, you know, they, they don't just need our support. They deserve it. Uh, if we want them to continue to exist, right, it's probably good to get out of the habit of, of ordering things on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as, you know, convenience is nice, I suppose, but... I'm, I'm glad you're here tonight and I hope you're supporting them and I'm glad that I'm grateful that they're supporting me. There are there are people in the audience actually tonight, some of whom I, I didn't expect to be, who have a lot to do with this book, interestingly. Um, the book is set at a restaurant, uh, the introduction rather, is set at a restaurant in Omaha, Nebraska, which I will unabashedly claim is the best restaurant between Yonville and uh, Chicago, mm -hmm. and it's run by that man, Matthew. Um, I have, <laughs> yes, I've, I've eaten there uh, at least once with my good friend from elementary, middle, high school, and college, Jamie, who's right there. And her father actually made a wine that was tasted at the tasting group at Beamer's, mm -hmm. uh, which comes up in the introduction, because this is a book about wine, but it's more importantly, I think, a book about art, and about the people who make wine, who are, I think, best regarded as artists. Um, and the wine in particular that Jamie's father made, uh, I didn't intend to talk about this tonight, but since she's here, this is, I think, very interesting, um, was a La Crescent grape varietal, uh, one of those hybrids bred at the University of Minnesota by Elmer Swanson. And Jamie's father grew those grapes and turned them into really exceptional wine. And I took them to this tasting group in a brown bag and we tasted them alongside other excellent wines and a number of really great palates spent significant time debating what this grape was and, and who might have made it and where it might be from. 
And of course, when it's all said and done and it's revealed, it's sort of a goodness gracious moment. Um, and, and a lot of people still talk about that wine that, that John made. Um, several people have asked me where they could get more, and I, I don't hand out his number, but uh, we should probably figure that out. But <clears throat> I think if we think back to 1976 and really before that, that wouldn't have been unreasonable here. I don't think it would have been at all unreasonable to think, you know, it, it, the Napa Valley, we knew, you knew, I was negative five years old in 1976, but those of you who've lived here for a while were, were well aware that what you were doing here was extraordinary. Um, I really do think so. But the rest of the world seemed to be convinced that only friends could make extraordinary wine. And I think that's why George Tabor, the only journalist who covered this event, referred to it as the Judgment of Paris. So we'll start there. The Judgment of Paris was, uh, historically or mythologically speaking, this was the event in which, right, the, the parents of Achilles, the warrior who later slays Hector and defeats the Trojans, um, they're getting married, and they invite all the gods and goddesses except one, and that's Eris, the goddess of discord. And, of course, this myths her. And so she shows up, and, and her, her response, her retaliation, her gate crashing, is to toss a golden apple that reads to the fairest one amidst the guests, who then fight over this apple. And uh, Aphrodite, Athena, and um, Hera, uh, probably the greatest of the Greek goddesses, uh, get to battle over this apple, and they say to Zeus, tell us, who's the fairest one? And Zeus isn't stupid, so... <laughs> He washes his hands of it, but Paris is stupid. Paris, the uh, the prince of Troy, the brother of Hector. He says, Paris, you, you decide who's fairest. And after a while, he does. And he chooses Aphrodite, and much to his detriment. And that's, I think, how this event is named by George Tabor. And um, that becomes kind of, a, kind of a central point of the book. Actually, all of the chapters focus, they begin with excerpts from the Iliad, one from uh, the Odyssey, right? But this is about the Odyssey of the Napa Valley. And that's what I felt so fortunate to be able to write about was this tremendous journey that the Napa Valley went on. Um, <clears throat> I, came to, I came to wine as a critic, and I'm not proud of it. Um, but I, I honeymooned here in Napa and Sonoma in, the, in um, I don't know, well, I shouldn't have, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about it. I was like, no, you really should know that. It's 2013. And, um, you know, the, the honeymoon was great. We visited a lot of brilliant properties, including Chapel of Helena, uh, which, of course, features heavily in this book. Um, and shortly after that, we started a blog, and then American Winery Guide reached out and said, I'd like to pay you to write articles about wineries. And as someone who majored in English, that was really exciting. Um, I don't know if any of you have a degree in English, but we don't generally get paid um, very well for anything, much less writing. Um, <laughs> and so that was, you know, that was pretty, that was pretty exciting. And I took the job, and I was probably spending $100 every time I made 75 but I was just, you know, enamored with what I was having to get paid to write. But it was also <clears throat> critiquing wineries and quickly uh, it, it came to a point where I was asked to critique wine and I was writing for Wine and Spirits magazine and I started reviewing Crudovino and on a private blog and I developed a huge platform. I was getting 100,000 unique hits every time I <clears throat> wrote about a wine. And I quickly decided I didn't like it. Now, just because I didn't like it didn't mean I stopped doing it. It was really lucrative. At one point in time, um, I received 48 unique bottles of wine from one producer, unsolicited, just arrived at my house. And, and being an honest, hardworking individual, I drank them all. Um, you know, to review them, of course. Um, I wrote an article on Cabernet Sauvignon one time and received 250 bottles of Cabernet Sauvignon in the mail. You know, I did great wine that I didn't have to pay for. And all of this seemed really cool, except for the part that what I was doing didn't make any sense. Um, and I think about, as, as, I, as I consider wine, I think about wine, I think in its purest form as art. It's a consumable form of art, but it is artwork. And thereby the people who created are artists. 
And I think sometimes, and I share this frequently, so if you've heard it before, forgive me, but I think sometimes about the absurdity of what we did as critics, you know, and what many still do, you know. Imagine, imagine somebody walking up to the, the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, you know, and being like, oh, it's, it's a nice painting. Yeah, no, I give it a 91. It's, uh, you know, the color contrast isn't exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, frankly, the broad is smiling a little much for my personal preferences, but, you know, I give it a 91. I mean, it's just stupid, right? I mean, we, we, would, just, we would just scoff at anybody who behaved that way in the Louvre. And yet if someone does it to our, to, to, to our form of art or to wine, it's like, oh, yeah, that's just a natural part of the process. Well, maybe it doesn't need to be. You know, and, and the most, the worst part of it, of course, is that then someone says to that critic, they're like, well, you know, Leonardo painted that. <laughs> oh, Leo, did I say 91? I meant 98. You heard me say 98, right, guys? Leo, I'll see you at dinner. You're buying. I mean, it's just, it's just such a dumb aspect of the industry. And so it took me a long time to pry myself out of it because I enjoyed the influence and I enjoyed the free wine, but I didn't want to be a part of it anymore. And when I did get away from it, I was able to focus on the people. And that's what makes me really happy is being able to learn about the people and write about the people and share their incredible stories. Some of them, certainly I could never show them all. But I think every time I meet somebody here in the Valley, I'm just kind of taken with them, you know? And sometimes they share beautiful things that I can share with everybody else in writing. And sometimes they share things that they don't want shared. And I try to honor that always, but it's it's always, I think, really interesting. So if we fast forward to 1976, since I guess that's what we're here to talk about, that's what changes the world, right? Um, it's, a, it's a hell of an event. You've got this Englishman, you know, I'll try to set the scene just a little bit. You've got this Englishman who's, who's who runs a wine shop in Paris, and that's every bit as absurd as it sounds. And he knows it. It's just that he's got money and he's interested and doesn't really have any other thing he wants to be doing. And he's met this beautiful woman, Bella, and they've gotten married. And so his, he's going to amuse himself and run this shop. And he is a hard worker. He's got a phenomenal palate. Um, and, and he develops relationships with the people who make the wine. And so he's able to kind of hack out a living. Um, not that he, again, needs the money. They're living on a houseboat on the Seine. Mm -hmm. And he's got... Uh, he's got... Uh, a partner who's kind of a lost soul from uh, the East Coast, an American named Patricia Gaston Gallagher, and she's got a contact here in California named Depoy. And and Depoy plants, plants the idea in Gallagher that there are some great wines being made here. And when Gallagher's back on vacation, she tastes them and she says, "Damn, you're right, those are really good." And she goes back to Spurrier and says to him, <clears throat> "You know, you really should try these wines." And for for several years, they had done this. Uh, tasting of American wines in Paris in the early 1970s. And that went exactly the way you would expect it to. But part of the reason it went the way you would expect it to is because the wines being exported, uh, what, what few wines were being exported at that time from California weren't, weren't the wines that, that Spurrier and, and Gallagher end up bringing over to be tasted. And the other reason is that the tastings aren't objective. Right, the wine is being tasted with the American label very visible. And so, where well, we're going to begin the story today, I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from my book to you, if you don't mind. I always enjoy being read to. Um, we're going to begin with the tasting today, and, and Spurrier is Stephen Spurrier, and Gallagher, of course, is his partner. And um, he's convinced this group of, of really well credentialed. French judges to show up at the Hotel Intercontinental in Paris and taste American wines. I suppose the downside is if I read you the book, you don't have to buy it. That's okay. Then again, if I can't find it, it won't make any difference. There we go. When all of the judges had at last arrived, Spurrier showed his hand. I've decided to change the rules, he said plainly, and offered, if you don't agree, I'll change them back. In fact, Gallagher herself initially disliked the idea. I did it anyway, recalled Spurrier. Instead of just tasting Chardonnays and Cabernets from California, I thought it would be interesting to match them against some benchmarks of similar vintages from Burgundy and Bordeaux. 
he told the judges, terming the idea a friendly glasses across the ocean blind tasting in celebration of American independence and in acknowledgement of the important role that the French General Lafayette played in the American Revolution. Spurrier recalled murmurs of Bonadi and Pas de Problème with no objections whatsoever. Spurrier then handed out the tasting sheets and Gallagher handed Tabor a copy of the tasting order so that he alone would know which wines were being tasted when. According to Tabor, the tasting began with a glass of Chablis, Chardonnay produced in the northernmost part of Bourgogne, to awaken the palates of the judges. From there, the white wines were tasted first. All told, there were six American wines and four French in the white category. The American wines were all Chardonnays and included Napa's Chateau Montalena 1973, Spring Mountain Vineyards 1973, Fremark Abbey 1972, and Peter Crest 1972, along with David Bruce 1973 and Chalon 1974 from farther south. While these American producers were entirely unknown in France, the French white wines were renowned and of the highest pedigree, hand selected by Spurrier. I certainly did not stint on the origin or quality of the French wines to give the Californian wines a head start, Spurrier later remarked. The French wines included a Pellini Montrachet 1972 and three wines from the 1973 vintage, Mersol Chang, Bon Claude de Mouge, and Bétard Montrachet. As the tasting ensued, Faber observed that the judges appeared nervous and uncertain, hardly the posture one would expect from the most respected wine experts in all of France. There was lots of laughing and quick side comments, Tabor later wrote. Tabor had the run of the place due to the other journalists and news outlets' refusal to take the tasting seriously and soon realized that the judges weren't only nervous, they were confused. They talked more than was customary and often disagreed with one another about the origin of a wine. Tabor took note of a number of instances in which a judge openly criticized the wine and in the same breath declared it American, when in fact it was French. Similarly, judges would compliment a wine's quality, certain of its French origins, and Tabor would cross-reference his sheet before silently jotting a note to himself, the wine was Californian. After one judge tasted a Fremark Abbey Chardonnay and responded aloud, ah, back to France, Tabor thought to himself, maybe I'm going to have a story after all. As the white wine tasting concluded, Tabor spoke to one of the judges who openly admitted our confusion shows how good the California wines have become. In a hurry to get out of the Intercontinental in time for the staff to set up for a wedding, Spurrier announced the results of the white wine tasting while the reds were being set up. The judges were horrified. They themselves had ranked an American wine first, and by a wide margin, no less. They themselves had awarded California wines three out of the top five places. How is this possible? The one wine they had been able to identify as American, David Bruce, they had been sure to properly disparage. But beyond that, the quality of the American wines clearly matched and even exceeded that of the French producers. The results, as read aloud by Spurrier to the consternated panel, were as follows. First, Chateau Montalena, 1973, from California. Second, Mersol Charm, 1973. Third, Chalon, 1974, from California. Fourth, Spring Mountain, 1973, from California. Fifth, Bone Claude de Mouche, 1973. Sixth, Fremark Abbey, 1972, from here in Napa. Uh, seventh, Bétard Montrachet, 1973. Eighth, Lini Montrachet, uh, 72. Ninth, Peter Kress, 72. And tenth, David Bruce, 1973. Faber admits to having been uncertain who won, given the French word chateau in the name of the Napa Valley's winner. But Gallagher quietly dispelled his doubts. According to his own account, Tabor felt a sense of pride that, as a journalist, he did not vocalize in the moment. So that moment, right, I think is of pivotal importance in the wine industry. And we, we know of it. We, we've seen this played out in Bottle Shock, which is amusing but terribly inaccurate. Um, you know, we, we've seen this written about, certainly. I think we don't really ever drill down into it deeply enough. Yeah. And, and so the thing that I like to say about it, and I'll leave it pretty briefly, but I would say because it was tasted first. Now, within an hour, the 1973 uh, Stag's Leap Wine Cellars Cabernet Sauvignon, made by Warren Winiarski, 
is tasted alongside some of the greatest uh, Bordeaux wines and comes in first place again. And that's every bit as significant. But because it was tasted first, I would say that the Chateau Montalena 1973 is the most important wine ever made because of how it changed the world. And if you're willing to accept that premise, then what I would say to you is that the most important wine ever made was made in the United States of America by a Croatian who studied under a Russian who was brought here by a Frenchman. And that to me is really the story and the nature of wine. I think that is one of the most beautiful things about this very cosmopolitan industry. It requires all of us. It's not an American thing. It's not a French thing. It's not anybody's thing. Wine belongs to everybody and everybody makes huge contributions to it. Um, we left it to actually in that vein. Uh, I was with a few of my friends here and we left a tasting a few hours ago uh, of a winery here in Napa that was founded by Argentines, um, which I think is wonderful. And then we went to, uh, a couple of us went to Gotts just because I needed a burger and to relax a little bit before I was going to come speak to this really intimidating crowd. <laughs> um, I should have had a shot or something. Um, <clears throat> there's still time. And and as we were sitting there waiting for a burger in Oxbow, I walked across the street to my friend Gustavo's tasting room. Gustavo Brambilla, of course, worked at Chateau Montalena in 1976. He wasn't part of producing the 73 Montalena, but he worked at uh, Chateau Montalena in 1976. He knew Mike Gergich, he knew Boubert very well, still does know both of them. Um, and then shortly after that, when Mike Gergich goes and founds his own winery, Gustavo goes and works for him for 20 years, and then Gustavo goes later and forms his own winery. And Gustavo, right, is, is, was born in Jalisco himself, so is a Mexican immigrant and is the children of Mexican immigrants. And at one point in time, Mike Gergich, Milenko Gergich of Croatia, is working for Andrei Chelyshev of Russia at Beaulieu Vineyard, mm -hmm. which is owned by the De La Tours, who are French. And they, these two, Gergich and, and Chelyshev, take Gustavo aside. And they say, oh, pardon me, they take Gustavo's father aside and they say, you need to send one of your children to college. They knew what he made. It wasn't enough. It didn't matter. They offered to help. You need to send one of your children to college. And Gustavo is the beneficiary of that. He goes to UC Davis. He studies wine. And so that's how he winds up at Montalena. And that's how he winds up at Gergich Hills. And now, of course, he's got a tasting room here in Oxbow. He makes extraordinary wine. If you've never tried it, don't wait beyond tomorrow. I don't know how late they're open tonight, but get in there tomorrow. That's really wonderful stuff. And on the back wall, I find this so touching. There are a few homages to Bottle Shock, the movie that he's he's actually portrayed as having a much larger role in that movie. And he, you know, he's good natured about that. But on the back wall is a, it's just a little sign. And actually, the picture appears in my book because I was so moved by it. And it just says, dreams come true. And I think that's uh, that's what wine has offered to a lot of us, a lot of people in this country. And I think that's that's pretty wonderful. None of us get to own it. It's a it's a really global story. Um, what happens after the judgment of Paris? Excuse me for a second. I'm just completely parched. Really, when I'm the one speaking, I hate doing that. <laughs> What happens after the judgment is actually, I think, far more significant than the judgment itself. A lot of people could and did try to write the judgment of Paris off as this one-off event. You got lucky, right? Uh, today, a lot of hippies would say, well, it was a root day, you know, or, or whatever, and, and that's fine. But they, they would try to write it off. they come up with some excuse, and they did. They said, well, American wines drink better when they're young, and the French wines age better. Uh, we won't really get into this tonight, but when they did a 10-year anniversary of the tasting, the winning wine came from Côte d'Ivoire, which sounds French, but is located in Stakes Leap. Um, and in every subsequent tasting after that, it's been uh, Ridge Montebello that has continued to win the tastings. What never happens is one of those French wines wins. That just doesn't. And it's not because they're bad wines. It's because ours are better. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, you know, but what really happened the judgment that's so important is that the doors opened, or as I write in the book frequently, thinking about the, the, the walls of Troy, the walls come down. 
And so it's it's not long after that um, that Goimio, which is sort of the French version of the Michelin Guide, and they had sent someone to serve as a judge at this tasting, um, puts on their own tasting, and they call it the Olympia du Monde, the Wine Olympics, and. Uh, they bring in wines from all over the world and they taste them against one another in different categories, primarily by the varietal that they were made out of. And so imagine this one day. I was up there. And Stu Smith is a very good friend of mine, Smith Padron. And if you don't know him, I would encourage you to get to know him. He's delightful. Um, but we were, I was up at Spring Mountain the other day and I'm looking at these tanks and I'm envisioning this. Well, one day, uh, Stu's up a ladder. You know, and it's, it's he and his brother, Charlie, who worked there at that time. Pretty much it. Just the two. Um... And uh, he's up the ladder and the phone rings, right? We don't have cell phones at that time. So he marches back down the ladder and he walks inside and he gets the phone. And he's been working for like 18 hours. He's like, yes, hello. Yeah. And, then, and, and it's a friend on the other line. He's like, you won, you won. He's like, won what? And his Riesling, he and Charlie's Riesling that they've been growing up there for so long was tasted in the Olympiade du Vaughan and declared the greatest Riesling in the world. And... Uh, it is pretty remarkable stuff if you haven't had it. But that wasn't unique. If you're standing at Smith Madrone looking down into the valley, you can see Sterling. And part of that is because it's kind of an eyesore, but you know, you can see Sterling from up there. And it was Sterling Sauvignon Blanc that won, which is not what we would probably have expected. And it traveled down the valley, and it's Trefethen's Chardonnay that won. Right, and so it's it's a lot of recognition for the Napa Valley shortly after the judgment, and so maybe you can't write this off, except then the proprietors of Domaine Druon, uh, uh, Maison Druon, I think it is in, in in Bourgogne, right, are are miffed, and so Druon himself calls up going the O and says, I want a list of the wines. He's, he actually, the letter, you can find the letter and you can read it. It's entertaining. He says something like, as, as a vigneron and a, and, a, and a Frenchman, I found what you did interesting and also deeply disturbing, you know? So I would like you to send me the uh, results. I would like you to send me the wines that were tasted. I'm going to get them myself. We're going to taste them at my chateau. I'll bring in new judges. We'll taste them blind, but you will see that it is French wine that is superior. And so they do this and they gather these wines and they bring them in. And they taste them in France. And uh, indeed, in the red wine category, he gets first place. His, his uh, Bourgognes get first place. A very close second place, though, in this global wine tasting goes to a Pinot Noir from a completely unknown region of the world called the Willamette Valley. And it certainly gets his attention because he buys a significant chunk of the Willamette Valley shortly after that and plants a bunch of grapes. Um, but when the white wines are tasted, it's Trefethen again. And to his credit, he doesn't come up with excuses. He doesn't disparage the wine. He doesn't come up with some reason why this must have happened. He simply says, okay, the Trefethen 76 Chardonnay is the benchmark by which we now measure Chardonnay. Um, it's kind of entertaining because most of the Trefethens will say the 77 was even better. <laughs> of course. Um, but these things just continue to happen. Not long after that, the Chicago Tribune holds the great Chicago Chardonnay showdown and they taste 400 and some odd Chardonnays from around the world. And Drew Hans, I think, comes in fourth. But of the top five, it's the only one that's French. And the others come from Heights and Montalena. And I think Remark Abbey, if I'm not mistaken. And number one is the very first vintage of a brand new winery that no one had ever heard of called Gergich Hills. And so this stuff just keeps happening over and over until it's completely undeniable that American wine can compete. But what's so cool about this and what's so significant, I think, isn't that the American wine can compete is that it opened the doors to the global wine market. There was no export market for New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc in 1975, you know? Like, I don't even know if the New Zealanders knew they made wine. I mean, I'm sure they did, right? But, you know, they certainly couldn't sell it to us. But today, if you walk into a grocery store, you can find an Argentine Malbec, right? You can find Chilean Carmenaires and all kinds of other terrific wines that we probably weren't going to have access to at all until this happened. And so it's really a significant event for a lot of reasons. 
So that's uh, that's a good chunk of the book. And that's what I set out to write about. It begins with a history that could only begin in one place, right? We've got all valleys are by definition riparian. This one was inhabited by beautiful people that, uh, you know, a thousand years ago that I tried hard to, to pay some level of, of meaningful homage to. And, um, and we, I tried to look at the history of the people who, who came after them. And I think this is a really uh, special place. But then my research took me in a, <clears throat> a very different direction. And uh, it's it's research that's still ongoing, and I'll, I'll, I'll certainly write more about this later. Um, and maybe we'll begin with a, a passage here, a short passage, and then we'll, we'll extrapolate a little bit. <clears throat> I forgot how much I like this line. I hope you like it. <clears throat> Somewhere in the unctuous, miasmic bowels of corporate America, the number crunchers were losing their minds. A planted acre vineyard in Napa could easily be valued at a half a million dollars, 500 times that of land in other parts of the country. And the damn things were going up in smoke 40,000 at a time. Housing costs were on the rise nationwide, but the median home price in Napa was fast approaching a million dollars. And those were just as, if not more, flammable than vineyards. And in such a limited geographical footprint, even the modest, inornate wineries were worth millions. With these staggering figures illuminated in the firelight, the insurance companies were beginning to conclude that there was no amount of money that could suffice as a premium to insure the Garden of Eden against the raging fires of hell. Many insurers made doubling premiums an annual tradition, as predictable as the winter solstice. At that rate, it didn't take long for small wineries to balk at the skyrocketing expense of insuring themselves against the flames. It's a lot more than it used to be, said Violet Gergich on the premiums that Gergich Hills was paying. We still have insurance, but she trailed off, raising her eyebrows in place of finishing the sentence. It's six times what it was five years ago, sighed the usually cheerful Dennis Groth in frustration. The hillsides are almost uninsurable now, said Nils Vengi, Groth's former winemaker, contemplatively staring up into the Vaca range. Up and down the Napa River, from the valley floor into the mountains, the story was the same. The response of the insurance industry to the wildfires was, in essence, what it had always been, Charge enough money in premiums that even when they had to pony up for damages, they'd still come out ahead. Tired, responded Stu Smith, asked how he was doing, and he sounded like it. In late August 2022, he and Charlie were in the midst of harvesting their coveted Riesling. Napa had once again been scorched and parched, and in addition to the usual toil of harvesting grapes, Stu had other things on his mind to boot. I feel like Satchel Paige, said Stu, <laughs> quoting the greatest pitcher of all time. Don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. In the fall of 2022, a lot of things might have been gaining on Stu and Charlie. The same things that were gaining on so many other small producers. The insurance companies just doubled our rates, Stu explained, adding that in 2022, Smith Madrone would pay more than $100,000 in fire insurance alone. In 2019, we paid 16000 he said, punctuating the point that between the fires and the insurance companies, what was gaining on the small wineries had the potential to catch and devour them. I'm considering going naked, Stu went on, using a common term for taking the risk of operating a winery in the ever incendiary valley without insurance. He was far from the only one threatening to do so. So far, in fact, that if something wasn't done soon to make fire insurance more affordable, the Napa Valley was liable to become a nude beach. I don't think anybody here is terribly surprised by those things. It was uh, I was up at Chapelet today, but it was uh, maybe a month or two ago I was up at Chapelet and I was speaking with Cyril Chapelet, one of the six siblings, um, and he told me that about their insurance you know, having doubled and doubled and, and the amount that they got in insurance went down while 
the price they paid went up and up and up. And it was only a few days after I talked to him that the figures that he was sharing with me were quoted in the register um, front page. And, and it is, it's really difficult to wrap your head around how people are going to manage that and if they're going to manage it or if it's going to be the end of these small wineries and the end of the industry. Um, but having said all that, there are there are some really innovative things going on as well. And I, th I really want to make sure that that this isn't a, a doomsday message, certainly not for the Napa Valley. I don't know what I would do without it. Um, you know, I think it's it's amazing. Uh, well, thinking of Chapel Day, what they're doing to protect their their vineyards um, between fire breaks and uh, a substance I'm not terribly familiar with, but apparently it's uh, it's not entirely biodegradable, but it shouldn't be harmful and uh, is, is a fire retardant that can be sprayed on vines. I certainly want to learn more about it, but the fact that people are innovating isn't surprising. It's 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 frankly sort of exciting. Um, there's also a lot of energy being devoted to regenerative practices, and I hope that people will spend some time on, on that topic, you know, and, and thinking about that. And, you know, there's a great group locally, Napa Green, and they host this wonderful conference, Napa Rise, that I was fortunate enough to be asked to chair a panel at last month. And the, the efforts, the regenerative efforts, carbon farming, um, things of that nature, um, have, I think, the potential to, to maybe save us. But the other thing that I think is maybe more important than anything else is the same thing that got us here, right? Because it was it was Chelyshev and Mondavi and any number of others who helped put Napa on the map, not by themselves, but by realizing that what we needed to do was share information. I think in France, they were rooted in tradition, but also they viewed so much of what they knew as being completely proprietary, right? And in Napa, these folks would get together, and, and and there are multiple groups that do this, but but certainly Mondavi and Chelyshev and others helped to form some of the early ones, and they would get together and talk about what worked and what didn't, right? And uh, and they would innovate together. And there weren't the silly rules here that there are in other places. You know, the, the French, and this is really, think of the Bordelais specifically. This is really fascinating, right? So it's not the same humans, but it's the same culture in Bordeaux. Uh, that when presented with a solution to phylloxera, tiny flax and bugs that eat grapevines and destroy them from the inside out and threaten to wipe out the whole industry, right? When phylloxera threatened to wipe out Bordeaux, they were presented with a solution. We can fix this. Graft your Bordeaux grapes onto American rootstock. And I don't know how to swear in French, but if I did, right, I'd, I'd be sort of mimicking that because I know, you know, that's what happened. It took them nine years to accept the solution. Nine years to decide to do that. And this same culture recently went, you know what? The place is burning to the ground. I suppose we should plant Tariga Nacional. And, and they've approved six new grape varietals in Bordeaux within the last couple of years um, that they're going to begin growing alongside those Bordeaux varietals that we all can name because they're as terrified of climate change as the rest of us. But what they're really doing is innovating. And I'm not much of a nationalist to say the least, but nobody's ever been better at that than us. Nobody's ever been better at innovating than Americans. And you've got people growing Bordeaux varieties in Garneros. And you've got people up north. At first it was Dan and now it's others at Larkmead planting varieties I can't pronounce and have never heard of. Certainly, you know, much less seen turned into wine. And they're planting them to see how they grow. Right? And then you got people like Julie Johnson, the only person I know of growing Zinfandel in Rutherford and, and doing remarkable things, right? To see how different ecosystems and creatures and practices and methods can save us. And they're going to get it done. I genuinely believe they're going to get it done. The alternative is uh, not something I really want to consider. And I believe in them. I believe in their ability to innovate. I do. Uh, the other thing, briefly, that threatens the industry is the same evils that has always threatened our species. And I think we have to think about that. 
Napa Green actually has made this one of their six pillars as in thinking about uh, sustainability and regenerative practices. And I think we all need to be thinking about it. Um, about 10% of master sommeliers are women, which means the other 90%, give or take, are not. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, and I've looked fairly deeply into it, there are four black African, uh, four, pardon me, four black master sommeliers in the world, I believe. Now it's possible that there are uh, not, they wouldn't be African Americans, but it's possible that there are Africans who are part of the European group and I don't have access to their information, but I don't know of them if they exist. Um, and even if, it, let's say, Dublin, I don't care. Let's say there are just as many in the European group as there are here in the States. Well, okay, then there are eight, Oof, you know. And, and so these same evils that have haunted our species for so long are, are directly haunting the wine industry. And I think that that's something that we get to play a part in as well. There are, you know, there, there's one African-American woman making wine in the Napa Valley that I'm aware of. And I would tell you that the wine is extraordinary and that we can support her. Um, there are a handful of African-Americans making wine. I mentioned Gustavo, but there's, there's a rich culture of Mexican and Hispanic people making wine. But again, we get to decide where our money goes. And um, I was asked by a university to give a talk um, in October that I'm gonna call conscientious consumption. And at the root of that, now see now you don't have to fly across the country to hear this talk because you'll get the gist of it now. The root of that is that we make a choice, we vote on who survives every time we spend our money. And for me, it's always been pretty easy to spend money on wine when I knew the people who were going to take that money over to the Sunshine Market or wherever they were going to go. Maybe they're going to go once that night. I don't really care where they go, but they're going to feed their family with the money that I just paid for their wine. And that I find really meaningful, especially juxtaposed alongside, you know, making some suits in New York a little bit richer. Um, I assume they're going to be fine, but they're not the people I'm out to try to protect either. So I want to wrap up, and then if, if you have questions, of course, I'd be happy to take them. And, and um, I can't imagine why you want me to deface a copy of this book, but I will if you want me to. Um, but uh, now, you know, I didn't mean to do this, but I just flipped to it. There, page 161 is a really cool photograph. It was taken by Jason Wise, who directed some. And uh, I, I don't have anything to do with this other than they gave me permission for it. But it's, it's Stephen Spurrier, the man who put on the tasting walking under uh, Stephen Spurrier Lane, which is a little road right in front of Clos de Vol, which I think is really cool. Um, and they just celebrated their, their 50th year. Um, there's, there's so much more. There's so much more we could talk about. Bernard Corte, some of the stories he told me from Clos de Vol are just so fascinating. But anyway, um, I, want, I want to end here. So I'll read the end of the book to you and thereby you don't actually have to read it because you, you've got everything you want. Right? Um, but I, I spent, I probably labored over this paragraph longer than any other. Um, and I want to remind you, of course, that on that golden apple that, that Iris tossed in that caused all this melee, right, was written the fairest one. And the dedication to my book actually is to the fairest one. And, and I intended that not as a wink wink to my wife who knows I love her and also doesn't read my books, so it doesn't matter. Um, but to the Napa Valley, the Napa Valley and the people who live here, those artists, that, that to me, that was the fairest one I was talking about. And so the book concludes like this. This morning, the Napa River flowed gently southward from its origin of Mount St. Helena toward the tranquil waters of the San Pablo Bay. And the sun emerged from behind the Vaca Range, warming the valley and burning off the fog as it passed in an arc on its way to disappear again behind the densely forested Mayacamas at the end of the day, just as it has always done. What lies between these two points of interest has changed hands and forms countless times over thousands of years, though the fact that it is a place of seductive and singular beauty devoted to agriculture and filled with skilled craftsmen and those who love the land, remains as true today as it has always been. In the end, no matter how long Bordeaux had been there, no matter how storied the soils of Bourgogne had become, no matter the what or the where, the who or the when, in the end, there could be no question. Paris had spoken. The Napa Valley had always been, and forever will remain, the Paris one. Thank you very much for coming in.
I have, uh, I've already told you everything I know, but if you do want to ask questions, I'm happy to try to drum something else up. <laughs> Please. Um, for my European friends, I always hear about the value for the, for the, the spend of mm -hmm. French wine versus California wine. And whether or not the best wine comes from California or France, the best value seems to be the European. Interesting. Do you have you heard that? Do you agree? Do you have a point of view? I strongly disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and you know, I mean, it's such a broad like. What does value mean? When I reviewed wine, I used to spend a lot of time writing and thinking about QPR, quality price ratio. Mm -hmm. um, and when people ask me what's good wine, I'm quick to tell them it's whatever you like so long as you can afford it, mm -hmm. right? And so when I reviewed for American Winery Guide, I gave Sutter Home four stars. And that prompted my editor to call me, uh, which he never did. And effectively, he said, what in the hell are you doing? You gave Sutter Home four stars. And I said, well, I mean, it was close to four and a half. And he said, what are you doing? Are you trying to get me in trouble? And I said, no. He said, this is one of the most important wineries in the world, right? How did you get, how did we all get from Bush Light to Napa Cab? There were rungs on that ladder and one of those was White Zinfandel and Sutter Home owns that. It's important stuff. You and I got drunk more than once on that stuff, I think, Jake. Yeah, I drunk <laughs> but, but it's not this, you know, the, in, in terms of value, and it really does matter what you like, and there are great values from all over the place. I think if you're looking for stunning value right now, I'm looking at Israel, I'm looking at uh, parts of South America, in particular, like the Umpqua Valley, um, South African wine. Um, when, you know, and, and, and you're probably, you, you probably need to be looking, right? Not necessarily going to your grocery store, but doing a little bit of digging and, and, and so forth. Um, but, but here's, I think, the, maybe the best example is we think about the wines. Well, if you tried to put together a tasting of the wines that were tasted at the Judgment of Paris, regardless of vintage, the wines from California are by far and away the cheap part. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm, I haven't actually ever said this out loud before, so if I'm wrong, forgive me. I think, thinking of current vintage, the most expensive wine tasted at the Judgment of Paris made in California would be a rich Montebello which is an extraordinary wine that always garners high praise and, and great scores. And uh, I think costs uh, 250 bucks. And you taste that a lot. You look at the Mouton Rothschilds, the Lafitte's, the, the Obreons, uh, Petrus, right? These are 15, 16, 18, $2,000 a bottle. You know, DRC, Domaine Romani Conti, uh, is going to be 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 thousand dollars a bottle if you can find it, and you probably can't. And there isn't an American Pinot Noir that gets anywhere near that. And so, you know, when I think about value, I actually, and, and especially when I think about the quality for the value, I frequently think about the Napa Valley. I do think that excellent quality wines are produced here at a relatively low cost, but we don't have a corner on that market. So, please. Another European objection I've heard uh, is that they love to blend, and yet Americans love their single varietals. Um, is that a valid uh, comparison? Is that like painting with primary colors versus blends? No, I and, and you know, I'll, 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 there are better psalms than me in the room for sure, but. I, I do have opinions about that too, but maybe I'll maybe I'll try to do something that you know. So, the seventy-two Clodoval Cabernet Sauvignon was the wine tasted at the Judgment of Paris, and it was eighty-five percent Cabernet Sauvignon and fifteen percent Merlot. And one thing I find really entertaining about that wine, I sat down with a guy who made it, Bernard Pote. Um, who just recently relinquished winemaking to Carmel Greenberg over there at Clos de Ball. And they're, I think they're now in their 51st year, maybe, and really an extraordinary winery. And uh, I asked him the question that had always been in my mind about that blended wine. I said, the wine that was tasted at the judgment was the wine you made the first year you opened. And he sipped, 
sips his wine. He says, yeah. He said, where'd you get the grapes? And he chuckled. And, and to my surprise, said, nobody's ever asked me that before. And I went, really? Because that's the most obvious question I could think of, you know. But he said, well, the, the Cabernet Sauvignon came from, and he pointed up the road just a little north of them in Stag's Leap on Silverado to what today is, um, is it Odette, I think? There are three little white sculptures out front. It's a pretty location. It was something else at that time. But he bought the Cabernet from them. And then he said, and I, I, I both love and hate this as someone who, who is infatuated with this history. He said, and the Merlot, I don't have any idea where I got that. <laughs> and, and I love that because it's just sort of fun. But I also realized that if he doesn't know, that information is probably lost to history, right? If he doesn't know, I don't think we're ever going to find out where that Merlot came from. But, you know, to, to your question and to the point, you know, there is a lot of single varietally made. I had, I had a Cabernet Sauvignon earlier today um, that was 100% varietal that just rocked. It was fantastic. But generally speaking, I think most American winemakers are pretty prone to blending um, and, and do a pretty good job of it. Um, what's, what's different here uh, frequently is that we put varietals on our labels a lot of the time. Not all of the time, but frequently, right? If you go to the grocery store, you might see a section called Cabernet Sauvignon. And most of those wines will actually say Cabernet Sauvignon on the label, especially if they were made in America or really in, in what we call the new world, right? Which is just basically not Europe. Um, but if you, you know, the, the Europeans, especially the Bordelais, the Rogonians, things like that, uh, those in the Rhone Valley, put the, the geographical designate on it. But it's just code. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you, you know, see a wine from uh, Cahors, Smallback, it'll say Cahors, but it's Smallback. And you can write Cahors on the label or you can write Malbec on the label, but that doesn't really change what you did. Right. Um, you know, the Cote right, is, is a, a Northern Rhone Valley appellation. It's the only one. They grow Syrah. So the Northern Rhone is. is Dominantly Syrah, right? In the Northern Rhone, um, Cote Roti in particular, I think it's the northernmost piece of the Northern Rhone. Well, they can blend Viognier, a, a traditionally white grape varietal, in that, which does cool stuff to the aromatics. Um, they're capped, I think, legally at 20%, is that right? Um, so they can only have up to 20% Viognier in it. And most of them don't use anywhere near that, but it is still really neat. Um, and does a lot to offset kind of the grippiness of the Syrah that's grown up there on the hillsides. But, you know, anyway, it's, um, the, you know, if you see that on the label, it's a different word, but it's telling us the same things, you know. And if you read Cabernet Sauvignon on our label, it doesn't mean that there's only Cabernet there. Okay. It means, well, in this case, it would mean 75% or more. Had the French started irrigating also? Because at one point they didn't, it was verboten. Do anything that didn't fall from the sky. You know, I don't. I don't know a whole lot about French vineyard practices. I, I do think there's irrigation over there. there but Matt, Matthew here is an advanced psalm, and, and if I hadn't made him come this weekend to a board retreat, would be a master next week. So my bad on that. Um, he'll take the exam next year. But uh, French vineyard practices. It's allowed in particular areas. It's not common or widely accepted in a lot of the traditional ones too. Okay. Um, but it's not completely banned. There are regional differences in that aspect. I see I bring people to help me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, anything else? I don't want to think. Um, I really enjoyed when you're talking about Stu Smith mm -hmm. and that was working when they called and I thought that really does reflect that it's the art because he's not working for an award. Mm -hmm. He's for some reason just decided he was going to be a wine or yeah. through the vineyard. Yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. He's, he, you could write, I mean, I think this is true. The more time I've spent in the Valley and meeting people, the more convinced I've become, you could write books about all of these people. Mm -hmm. They're so interesting. They've lived such rich, fascinating, often difficult lives. Um, I'd love, I'd, you know, to sit down, I'd love to write the story of Smith Madrone as a book at some point, you know? Um, and sometimes those stories are, are rough. And sometimes they're just, sometimes they're fun. So one of my favorite stories I came across uh, when I was researching the book. So Stephen Spurrier passed away a couple of years ago. His wife, Bella, is still alive. 
And they actually, this relates to a lot of things we talked about, but they planted vineyards in their home in England, in Southern England. Um, and it's called Brine Valley Vineyards. And they have that turned into some really exceptional wine, sparkling wine predominantly. It's interesting to know that the Champenois, uh, the people of Champagne, are buying up Southern England hand over fist because Champagne is getting warmer. Vintages are getting riper. Every year's a vintage year now. And crossing a little bit of water seems to buy them some time. And they're real interested in what's going on in Southern England, where previously it was believed you couldn't make wine, you know, even grow grapes. But Bella came with Stephen over here. And one of the people I wrote about who I really admire. Now, I didn't know him. I never met Joe Heights. Um, and he passed away many years ago. But he's he was the founder of Heights Wine Cellars. And um, he was not very interested in this Englishman. Um, and and so originally, when, when Stephen showed up to taste his wine, he was like, I, I'm kind of busy. Why don't you go away? You know? Um, Stephen... I got a hold of a bottle of his Chardonnay and compared it to a Marcel Charme, which was Joe's wife's favorite wine and what Joe was trying to emulate. And I would say he was probably, I mean, Joe was probably doing a great job of emulating it because Spurrier's palate was renowned. And I don't think he was being disingenuous. But all of a sudden, Joe was like, oh, come on in, you know? Um, and Joe... Um, Spurrier referred to him as a charming curmudgeon. And I think a lot of people around here who knew him probably felt sort of similarly. But Joe um, was tasting Bella and Stephen on his wines out of barrels in the uh, mid-1970s, early 1970s. And Bella told me this story. She, she got her glass and she swirled and sniffed and tasted as one does. And then as one does, she spit the wine in the general direction of a floor drain in the barrel room. And Joe went, ah, that's disgusting. And I thought it was such a, you know, as we think about the, the clash of cultures that we're really talking about here, I thought that was such a fun, you know, I, I don't know if that's, you know, I don't, I don't typically spit in barrel rooms, but I understand why people do, and I probably have done, you know. So, um, yeah, the people are just really fun to write about, and, and probably none more than Stu and Charlie Smith. You know? Um, if there are other questions, I'm happy to take them, but I don't want to keep you all night. There's good wine to be had out here, so. <laughs> Should be, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you again for coming. I'd be happy to talk to anybody individually. Okay. Okay.